Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Todd Roberts. I'm the Chancellor at the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics, and I want to welcome you to today's event, Building Coalitions for Positive Change. I'm so excited that we have been able to convene an amazing group of leaders for today's talk and panel discussion on how communities can come together to achieve positive change. When we think of impacting a community, this could mean our most immediate community, like our school or our neighborhood, or it could be larger, like, our, like a city or state, or even larger and more expansive, like a country or an entire continent. As is, as is the case when we think about our keynote speaker, former president of Liberia and Nobel laureate, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. In, in any of these cases, large or small, positive change begins with the actions of individuals. And I am so thrilled that President Sirleaf is here with us today. As you will hear about in her introduction, President Sirleaf has led an amazing life that has brought about positive change in her championing of women's rights, country and beyond, and leading her country as president, where she helped establish democracy after decades of civil war and facilitated a peaceful democratic transfer of power. President Sirleaf's visionary, principled, and tireless is an example of how an individual who builds bridges and forms coalitions can bring people together to affect systemic and lasting positive change, even in the most challenging of situations. I would like to thank the Bernard family for making today's event possible by inviting President Sirleaf to join us. NCSSM senior Daria Bernard is President uh, Sirleaf's grandniece, and Daria's parents, Heidi and Earl Bernard, are niece and nephew. Also, Jenny Bernard, who is President Sirleaf's sister, is with us today and will be asking one of the questions. Thank you all so much for making today possible. And I want to thank our panelists and all the speakers joining us today. We greatly appreciate your being a part of today's event and sharing your insights with us. I want to say a huge thank you to all the folks in our humanities department at NCSSM who've worked so hard to make today's event possible. Tanya Smith, Liz Peoples, Adam Sampieri, and Elizabeth Moose. And thanks to Lee Welper and Donald McIntyre for setting up and, and running today's webinar. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Pamela Scully, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Dr. Scully is a professor of women's gender and sexuality studies, professor of African studies, and provost for undergraduate affairs at Emory University. She has her PhD in history from the University of Michigan, and her research focuses on comparative women's and gender history and biography. Her latest book is Writing History, which is co-authored with Professor Fiona Paisley. Her other books include Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and Sarah Bartman and the Hot and Tot Venus, a ghost story and a biography, co-authored with Clifton Crace. Professor Scully's teaching focuses on the history of sexual violence in wartime and gender violence and gender justice in the context of the Truth Commissions in Africa. She's the co-convener of the Coursera MOOC, Understanding Violence, among her other professional appointments, Professor Scully has served as the deputy editor of the Women's History Review and as treasurer and secretary of the International Federation for Research in Women's History. She currently is chair of the uh, Committee on Gender Equity at the American Historical Association. Dr. Scully, thank you again so much for being with us today and thank you for joining us for this today's amazing program. Thank you so much, Chancellor Roberts. Uh, I am thrilled and honored to be uh, introducing President uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who I've long admired, uh, indeed had the opportunity to write about in a variety of ways, but not to uh, meet personally, although we have actually been at the same sort of functions, but uh, it is indeed an honor. I also want to say thank you very much 
to the National School of Science and Mathematics for inviting me and particularly to Ms. Tonya Smith, who's been a wonderful liaison for me. So uh, really it is truly an honor and I am delighted. Um, I do just want to say that I've experimented over um, this COVID Zoom era in how best to, to um, you know, work with Zoom. So I'm actually gonna use old fashioned notes in front of me. I'll be looking up and down, but that seemed um, the best way for me to communicate. So um, there are many things one can say about President Sirleaf and there are volumes um, of information uh, written about her that you can find on the web. There are at least two books written about her. Um, and so I thought today what I would do is just highlight some, some of her achievements that I think are particularly noticeable um, and particularly notable um, and really demonstrate the kind of leader that she is. So um, President Sirleaf was elected president in Liberia in 2005. Her first term started in 2006. Um, and she did uh, become president after a really terrible civil war in Liberia, in West Africa, uh, in which uh, armies used child soldiers, sexual violence was used as a weapon of war. Um, there was incredible internal displacement of people and also many, many Liberians fled to other countries in West Africa, to Europe, and indeed to the United States. And I know that, you know, we have many Liberian communities, including in North Carolina. Um, so she took office at really, at a, at a really, really critical time. Um, and the reason that President Sirleaf was in fact elected president was precisely because she had already been a leader. She had served in various Liberian governments, she had also worked for the United Nations in senior capacities, also with the World Bank, as well as many other organizations. Um, she had and has expertise in finance and in administration and does have an MA in public administration from Harvard. So President Sirleaf was already a formidable leader uh, when she became president of Liberia in 2006. But it is really her presidency uh, of the country that has, um, I think will be her one of her most lasting legacies. Uh, and indeed there are many. Um, she, in becoming president of Liberia, uh, President Sirleaf became the first democratically elected uh, woman leader on the continent of Africa. And um, I'm not sure that we are always appreciative of how huge the continent is. You can fit China, India, the United States, and other countries into the whole continent of Africa. So um, to be a leader of that, you know, of a country in that continent is already impressive and to be the first democratically elected woman leader, uh, even more so. Uh, and so President Johnson Sirleaf's accomplishments as president are, are many and legion. Uh, she is known for having promoted women's rights. She is known for having brought indeed decade and we were actually heading to two decades of stability to Liberia, which really it had not enjoyed very much before. Um, she helped reform the legal process. She helped reform the police. She brought foreign investment back into the country. And I think one of her most notable achievements was also encouraging Liberians who had fled Liberia over the many years, both before and during the civil war to return home. So when I was there in you know, 2007, 8 and 11, it was very clear that there were a, a lot of investment going on and by both um, Liberians who'd fled and Liberians who'd stayed. And so um, those are no mean achievements for, for any leader. Um, and because of these achievements, uh, Sirleaf was elected president again in 2011. Um, you know, often we want to sanctify leaders so I do just want to lift up that to be a leader, you have to make really difficult decisions. And to be a leader, you have to be prepared for criticism and for making mistakes. And I think one of the um, elements of leadership that perhaps we don't make enough of is a willingness of a leader to admit they're wrong and to pivot. And that I think is rare. And I do want to hold up President Sirleaf for having done that. So for example, I want to hear just quickly talk about Ebola um, and Liberia's experience of Ebola. Ebola is a hemorrhagic disease that came 
uh, to, uh, to West Africa in about 2014. It had never really been seen in West Africa before, um, previously been seen primarily in the center, center of Africa, Central Africa. Um, and so people were unfamiliar with it. it was, it's an incredibly scary disease. If you touch the body of someone who's died of Ebola or is dying, you are likely to get it. And um, the death rate is very high. So early on in the, uh, the um, outbreak in Liberia, Sierra Leone and Guinea, um, the world really stood by and watched. Uh, the World Health Organization was not as fast as it should have been in, in coming to help or recognizing the, the severity of this outbreak. And so Liberia and its neighboring countries were pretty much left on their own. And in the early days, um, there were some missteps. But what I want to say is that President Sirleaf soon recognized that a different approach had to be taken. And she worked with traditional elders, with women's groups, with spiritual leaders to really produce locally based uh, sort of collaborative public health responses. And so by the time the World Health Organization and indeed the United States kind of woke up uh, and got the act together, frankly, um, and brought supplies and tents and, and doctors to um, West Africa, certainly in Liberia, I would say that Liberians had really helped end Ebola themselves. And so I really just want to commend um, President Sirleaf for, for, for you know, realizing that the approach had to change and helping people do that. Um, so finally, you know, in recognition of her wonderful leadership, President uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2011 with her compatriot Lema Bowie and Tamakal Kalman from Yemen. And the Nobel Committee gave the Peace Prize to these three wonderful um, leaders, uh, quote, for their non-violent struggle for the safety of women and for women's rights to full participation in peace building work. And certainly uh, President Sirleaf really realized that commitment in, in much of her, her leadership as president also. Um, and then finally, um, you know, there are so many awards that President Johnson Sirleaf has received, I think I counted 1.23, and I'm sure there are many, many more that I don't know. But in 2007, the US did award her our you know, um, highest honor, the Presidential Award of Freedom. And um, in 2017, just as President Sirleaf was stepping down, she received the Ibrahim Prize for Achievement in African Leadership. Um, and as in many cases in her life, she was the first female recipient. And this is a really wonderful prize of a start in 2007 to encourage and recognize good governance and is awarded to a leader who in the previous three years, um, you know, was democratically elected and then in the last three years, democratically transitioned uh, in a peaceful transfer of power. Um, and in their recognition of President Sirleaf uh, as the recipient, they said, since 2006, Liberia is the only country out of 54 to improve in every category and subcategory of the Ibrahim Index of African Governance. So it is my great honor to introduce this wonderful leader of African international and indeed historical stature, President Sirleaf. Dr. Todd Roberts, Chancellor. Dr. Scully, and let me say thank you so much for the introduction. Officials, professors, students, and community of NCSSM, invited participants. I'm pleased for the opportunity to join you in this exchange on building coalition for positive change. There is no better way I could share my thoughts on the topic than to start with the experience of my own country, Liberia. When I assumed the presidency of Liberia in January of 2006, I found a country decimated and dispirited after two decades of conflict. A collapsed economy destroyed infrastructure dysfunctional and in some cases, non-existing institutions greeted me. Although I had known our society to be entrapped by deep internal divisions and societal fractions, 
because of the lack of a single national identity, it was difficult to understand the deep impact of the war on the past efforts at nation building. Founded as a state in the 1840s by former enslaved persons brought back from the United States, tensions between a small urban elite and a large indigenous majority sow the seeds of tension, mistrust, and conflict still present today. The protracted war and its tribal undertones inflamed the divisions and pronounced tribal identities over national. Not to be ignored was the occurrence of a bloody coup d'etat of 1980, which witnessed the murder of a sitting president. And so, not only had the unfortunate divisions become even more rife, the security of the state was threatened by the possibility of a return to conflict, either by tribally aggrieved elements with the experience to do so, or a copy of 1980. Admittedly, also, resentment lingered in the class of the so-called haves and powerful, many of whom had dominated a political culture rooted in corruption, bribery, rent-seeking, and a willingness to hold the national interests hostage to personal gains. And for many who had become hopeless and were without jobs or the necessities to care for themselves and their families, my historic election represented a chance, not just to fix the problems, but to do so quickly. The environment was anything but organized. Setting a new national agenda means cutting across lines that included victors and victims, tribal and religious sects that had become mutually suspicious of each other finding common ground with combatants and warlords who were elected as representatives and senators and building accountability systems where public accountability had never been demanded. Children recruited into the war as soldiers and without life skills, as well as thousands of uneducated and unemployed young people joined the list of those demanding from the government what it did not immediately have to give. The workforce was largely comprised of an unskilled and poorly compensated civil service. Indeed, many of the nation's problems have multiplied exponentially. But I was not a total stranger to the challenges we faced. I had been part of the body politic since my speech in 1969, when I challenged the policies of President William V. S. Tubman, and I had remained engaged with and an activist for change through every successive administration, except those times in exile when I was engaged in professional international service. As you can expect, the euphoria of my election passed very quickly. With colleagues, we formulated a development agenda. I knew that there was no manual for being the first woman post-conflict president in Liberia. But I was confident that if anyone could do it, I could. I was also convinced by an important aspect of my victory the overwhelming support of the women of Liberia. I had been elected on the shoulders, sweat and tears of women. Combined with the elderly and young progressive, they inspired a victory with the message of being tired with visionless, visionless male domination. Our people yearn for change. 
their yearnings demonstrated in my historic election further energize and embolden me to work for change. I also had the approval of Africa and the international community. Over the period of our conflict, the boomerang effects were felt across the region, continent, and the world. Liberia's peace and democratic governance meant almost as much to Liberia as it did to the region, the African continent, and the world. And as leader, I was determined to ensure that Liberia could be a good neighbor and helpful to the maintenance of international peace and security. I knew I could never do this alone. And so I put together a team of young professionals and a small group of trusted advisors to supplement my personal experience and years of professional service in international executive positions. I laid down broad principles and agreed with the team that rather than using existing standards or the lack thereof, we would lift ourselves and hold on to higher standards with me setting the example and leading from the front. The small team proved useful for a while, but change required much more. I needed a broader coalition of all those who represented the various divides if I would succeed in rebuilding the nation. I needed this for security and peace and knew that I had to make compromises and build relationships to break down the lingering suspicions and build the trust required. This coalition would include Liberians in the diaspora who had been exposed to professional work and accountable standards of service from which others at home would learn and adapt. And as a piece of a broken nation, I needed to rebuild the civil service from scratch and set new standards for payments that will make a demand for improved performance and accountability reasonable. A broader coalition, especially through appointed executive positions that included representatives of all parties, religions, and tribes of the divide from home and the diaspora was also a means of building an even stronger collaboration for the positive change required for reconciliation and the rebuilding of our devastated country. In this regard, preference was given to women and youth, the former restricted by the unavailability of some of the women to whom I reached out in my effort to achieve an all women cabinet. However, I ensured that their impact and authority was felt in the portfolios they held. In further action, we established a program pattern after that of the World Bank. The President's Young Professional Program, PYPP, a fellowship program held by generous support from foreign aid initiatives, charities, and substantial spending from the national budget for personnel to recruit and train civil servants. We also set up a promotion system based on merit, created whistleblower, whistleblower protections, and ensured that new civil servants were well supervised, proactively mentored, and part of a peer network which held them accountable for their actions. Notably, PYP included graduates from local universities who were teamed with monitor and supported by repatriated national professionals in a coalition that reduced the potential tension between the two groups. Today, 86% of the program fellows are in the civil service after the transition to the new administration, thereby providing continued crucial public service with efficiency and integrity. Throughout the 12 year period of my administration, we had small pockets of skirmishes due to public land and benefit issues, 
among citizens themselves and with private concession. But we also, we also experience violence from young people suffering from post-war trauma. But we ended our two-year, two-term presidency with Liberia at peace with itself and its neighbors was widely considered a post-conflict success story and a safer and secure country than we inherited. In 2014, Ebola, a deadly virus disease unknown to the country struck. Given our lack of knowledge of the disease, collapsed health infrastructure and the lack of resources, the educated projection by credible international organizations was that Ebola would kill at least 20,000 Liberians monthly. The projections were correct about what we crucially lacked and did not have, but they were wrong in my view about what I knew we had. I knew Liberia and Liberians to possess resolve and resilience. And I knew that as the leader, if I could encourage the nation to mobilize that resolve and resilience with the health and support of the international community, we could eradicate the disease and beat the projections. To mobilize the national resolve and resilience, I again knew I needed to build a broad coalition where I could not suspend certain religious practices and rights, the respected cleric that the sect could. We've reached out to and involved political, civil society, religious, traditional, and community leaders. We built a coalition from bottom up, providing the space for everyone to get involved in the ownership of the problem and the solution. I appeal to the international community for the resources we lacked. Led by the United States, the response was favorable. Although reported as the hardest hit of the three worst affected countries, Liberia was first to be declared Ebola free. I cannot end this discussion without talking about the need to build global coalitions to eradicate our world of the devastated COVID-19, a pandemic that has left untold costs in human lives, economic growth, and exposure of the global inequities and injustices, particularly for the marginalized populations, such as women and youth. COVID-19 hit the world at a time when global leadership had lost its pilot, paving the way for slides into nationalism, populism, isolationism, and presenting a major threat to democracy that had been largely institutionalized in a greater part of the world. At the same time, the pandemic has continued to highlight the deeply interconnected and interdependent nature of our world in trade, finance, travel, and communication technology. From climate change to nuclear proliferation, from social injustices and exclusions to gender inequalities and inequities, from ending poverty to ending the many senseless wars, the truth is that if the presenting unfortunate global reality of this pandemic is not a clarion call to come together, to work together to overcome our common challenges, I don't know what is. The truth also is that what affects all of us must involve all of us in its solution for all of us. This is common sense. Even as it seeks to rob us of our lives and livelihoods, we cannot permit the virus to rob us of our common sense. Sometimes when all seems impossible, we just have to fall back on common sense. 
I know this because it formed the basis of my experiences as the leader of a fractured and devastated nation. Building broader coalitions, including across perceived differences, can also be meaningfully applied to the global fight against COVID-19 because the virus has not just affected all peoples and nations of the world, without regard to our perceived differences, it has also exposed our mutual vulnerabilities, exacerbated the deep inequalities that continue to exist, both within and between nations. And despite our claim to differences, continues to threaten all humanity without exceptions. The depth of cooperation that is required to tackle this pandemic would be challenging to receive, to achieve, even in the best of times. It cannot therefore be expected that as the economic conditions are worsened, nations will be stronger and capable of fighting alone. Added to this is the troubling consideration that the virus has struck at a time when the multilateral systems have been under sustained threats. The only way to effectively contain COVID-19 is therefore through global multilateral coordination. Indeed, there is no issue on which, on which the case for multilateral cooperation is clearer or in more urgent need of global collaboration than in the tackling of the pandemic, the outcome of which will rise to become the preeminent example of a global public good. The virus will not be overcome unless all states work together, pooling resources and expertise to strengthen health systems, develop and distribute an effective vaccine, protect health workers, protect vulnerable communities, and provide the necessary care to all who need it in society. Nobody is truly safe until everybody is safe. All must therefore be involved in a solution whose problem is collective and borderless. I want to close by speaking about some of the most important coalitions in which I'm involved post-presidency. These are coalitions with women and men convinced of the urgent need for gender equality. As the COVID-19 pandemic unfolded, it became clear that women's leadership and countries with gender equal national structures were the keys to halting the crushing impact. Through the African Women Leaders Network, AWIN, and more recently, the African European Union Women Leaders Network, I have joined other women leaders to give voice to women working at the community and national levels, as well as to impact global policies. In addition, the AMUJ Leaders Initiative of my own center is building coalitions among talented and influential African women who are ready to help steer their countries away from the calamitous rocks of exclusion and inequality. The recent election in the United States with the first woman and woman of color as vice president and President Biden's statements on the need for global cooperation and the return of multilateralism have generated interest and accolades across the world, not only in the United States. This augurs well for meaningful collaboration and increased solidarity with the people of the United States, particularly women and women of color. I hope that this discussion with you today can give us, all of us, some impetus and ideas toward that. 
particularly working with African-American women and their communities. The inequalities in the provision of vaccines for COVID-19 are not only in poor countries. We see them in many disadvantaged communities in the United States, unfortunately. I'm grateful for this invitation today and excited about the ties that can be created, as well as the solidarity for some solutions to problems which affect our common communities on both sides of the ocean. Hopefully, a new world order is on the horizon. May it grow into one that builds coalitions for positive change. May it inspire the common truth of our humanity that we owe a duty to each other to make our communities, countries, and world a better place for ourselves and for our children. And to do this by seeking to find common grounds to always seek to work together. I thank you. Thank you very much, President Johnson Sirley, for your powerful and wonderfully inspiring address, as well as your call to work together at all levels to solve our mutual challenges collaboratively. It is my sincere honor and privilege to have this opportunity to learn from you today. At this time, representatives from the various constituents present will pose a few questions that have been generated by each of the groups represented here. NCSSM senior and president of the African Cultures Club, Essie Aqua will represent the NCSSM student body. Dominique Beaudry, a social studies teacher at Jordan High School here in Durham, North Carolina, and the NCSSM graduate will represent Durham Public Schools. And Mrs. Jenny Bernard, Madam President's very own sister and grandmother of our very own NCSSM senior, Daria Bernard, and a student in my African Studies class, will represent our guests from the community. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and thank you so much for spending your time with us today. It's truly an honor to hear from you and learn from you. My question comes from Durham Public Schools and it's from a student asking, how were you able to remain optimistic and hopeful throughout such challenging times? Well, first I rely on my trust in God one that's been instilled in me and my siblings from my mother. I also rely on a strong and caring family and friends. And I rely on the, the co-workers, the assistants I have that continue to motivate me but I think most of all, I rely on my own self-confidence, the confidence to continue to work toward the achievement of my goals and the success of which I dream. Thank you so much. Hi, you once said to girls and women everywhere, I issue a simple invitation to my sisters, my daughters, my friends, find your voice. How do you define a person's voice? Additionally, how can someone begin on a path to discovering her voice? Listen to the voice of those who have courage to stand up for the principles they believe in. 
just listen to those who are able to rise above fears, to care not about the popularity that others seek, that are able to take positions and to stand firm in their beliefs. I don't think it's so difficult to define those voices. They're all around us in our home, in our school, in our churches, in our communities, in the markets, in rural communities, when someone is just able to take a position, to stand firm, to be caring, to be empathetic about the things they love and the things they believe in. That voice isn't hard to find, it's there. And it's loud and clear and it can influence the others to join that rapture of voices that make a difference in the world. Thank you. People tend to relax a little when a small improvement occurs, but how do you keep people, including yourself, focused on the bigger picture of social equity and greater representation? Keep talking, keep working, keep moving, keep doing things that are unexpected. Keep trying to push the needle just one little bit further. Push back the frontiers of possibilities. Showing courage, the mindset, building coalitions, motivating others for collective change, ensuring that you can turn that narrative around. You can make a difference by reaching out, by joining others, by supporting others, by not only elevating yourself, but reaching back to elevate others. I think we see that all around us in everything we do by so many of those whom perhaps we don't pay enough attention to. You don't, that small voice that's there, that little bit of action that's there, the one thing that makes a little bit of difference in somebody's life that causes somebody to change around and say, I can be different. I can do it differently. I can change my lifestyle and the life of others around us. And sometimes, it doesn't take much. Just take that extra effort of commitment, of passion in what you believe in and what you want to do. Thank you. President Jones and Sirleaf, on behalf of the NCSSM community, thank you so much for joining us today, for your work, and for inspiring us to build a better world together. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Would you like to say any closing words? Oh, to all of you there in the MC, am I getting it right? MCMMNS, am I getting N it right? NCSSM. <laughs> MCSNM. Do something, say something. Be something, most particularly be yourself and be what you want to be. Claim it, it's always there when you seek it with determination and courage and steadfastness. To all of you, your future in your hands not only yourself and your family and your community, but your nation now needs each of you to think differently, to see the changes that are happening in our world. 
and to be a part of that change. Do it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we are now going to open the chat during our brief intermission, and we encourage attendees to share what they found inspiring about today's speech. We will rejoin here in five minutes for a panel of community leaders who are working together in their fields and communities to build these coalitions for a positive change. Thank you so much.
everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you again for joining us and for staying with us. Uh, we'll continue our discussion of building coalitions for positive change with a panel discussion of local community leaders sharing how they are working for positive enduring change in Durham and across North Carolina and the world. My name is Adam Sampieri, and I am one of two chairs of humanities here on the Durham campus of the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics. And it is my honor to be joining our panelists. I am uh, so very excited to introduce to you now. Vernetta Alston is a graduate of NC State, UNC School of Law, and is a lifelong resident of the Triangle. In her work as a criminal law attorney, she fought for the constitutional rights of death row inmates and has advocated for the abolition of the death penalty. She was a member of the Durham City Council and is currently a representative for District 29 in the North Carolina House of Representatives. And we are so fortunate to have her with us today. Welcome, Representative Alston. Thank you for having me. Mandy Carter is a Southern African-American lesbian activist with a 54-year movement history of social, racial, and LGBTQ justice organized in the 1960s. Ms. Carter helped co-found two groundbreaking organizations, Southerners on New Ground and the National Black Justice Coalition, and is a member of the National Council of Elders. In 2011, Ms. Carter was chosen as the American Civil Liberties Union, North Carolina Lucky for us, she moved to Durham to work for the War Resisters League when she did and has stayed with us ever since. Welcome, Mandy. So glad to be here. The executive director for Wiser International, a nonprofit organization focused on supporting holistic approaches to girls' education and health in rural Kenya. A nonprofit professional with a focus on localized partnerships. Zach has experience in health and education initiatives in Africa, Asia, and North America. Zach is a Duke Scholar and a previous winner of the Paul Farmer Award for Justice and Social Responsibility. He currently sits on the Board of Directors for the NC School of Science and Mathematics Foundation, the North Carolina Chapter of the New Leaders Council, and the Amplify Girls Collective. And I even had the joy of having him in class right where I am right now. <laughs> Hi, Zach. Hey, Adam. It's good to see you. Thank you for having me. Barbara Lau connects her commitment to justice with her belief in the power of community practice through her work as the lead developer of the Pauli Murray Center for History and Social Justice. Barbara's 20 years experience as a folklorist, curator, professor, media producer, and author include curating the exhibition Murray, Imp, Crusader, Dude, Priest, producing To Buy the Sun, an original play about Pauli Murray, and co-directing the Face Up Telling Stories of Community Life, Community Mural Project. She is a recipient of the 2014 Faculty Award from the Samuel Du Bois Cook Society at Duke University and the 2012 Carly B. Sessoms Award for the Durham Human Relations Commission for her leadership. And she is our guest this afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us, Barbara. Thank you. And I have to say, I'm proud to be one of the people who had Zach Fowler in my classroom as well. Oh, the two of us have been fortunate. <laughs> um, uh, and finally, Dr. Pamela Scully is Professor of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, Professor of African Studies, and Vice Provost for Undergraduate Affairs at Emory University. Her research focuses on comparative women's and gender history and biography. Professor Scully's teaching uh, focuses on the history of rape in wartime and gender violence mm -hmm. and gender justice in the context of truth commissions in Africa. Among her professional appointments, Professor Scully has served as the Deputy Editor of the Women's History Review and as Treasurer and Secretary of the International Federation for Research in Women's History. She currently is Chair of the Committee on Gender Equity of the AHA yeah. and has graciously agreed to join us today. Welcome back, Dr. Scully. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. So my sincere hope is that as much as, as much as you hear from me in one large chunk this afternoon, um, I'm much worse as we all are in what you all have to share and say. So I hope uh, we can just have a discussion back and forth. Um, and as everyone has themselves unmuted, so uh, we can easily uh, go back and forth. So I'll toss something out to get us started uh, and then we'll just kind of proceed from there and we have the next uh, hour together. So um, thank you again. Um, I feel so fortunate you know, to, have, uh, to be with all of you today and together to have had a chance to um, hear Madam President uh, mm -hmm. Ellen Johnson Sirley's remarks. Um, 
that work is obviously, of course, inspiring to all of us. I think we all felt mm -hmm. that there. And so too is all of your work. Um, and I think that might be a good place for us to start from inspiration. So uh, I would open up to think about, first off, what from uh, the remarks we just heard resonate with you, uh, inspire you? What parallels can you see between uh, that and the work that you all do? And I'm wondering if Mandy would be willing to get us started. Can I? Well, thank you. And I want to also shout out that Vernetta Olson is my uh, representative of, over in the North Carolina General Assembly. So shout out to you, Vernetta. Hello, lucky me to have that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the timing of this could not be more fortuitous. I'm sitting here so thankful for President um, Sirleaf. Um, an organization that I belong to is called the War Resisters League, was founded in 1923. But War Resisters International was founded in 1921. This is the 100th anniversary of the founding of the War Resisters International. So to be having this conversation with her, with the backdrop of what happened, I'm in Liberia. Um, I'm just trying to figure how we talk about this. And one of the ones I would say to you, I remember going to high school and barely ever did we talk about anything but the United States. You know, the United States initials are us, meaning all we focus on are. But I was thinking that um, with the War Resisters International, I did a little backdrop real quick because the timing of this is good. It was founded in the Netherlands in 1912, and it was a global network of sort of like grassroots, um, a lot of uh, uh, different countries trying to figure out how do we end war as a way to resolve conflict. And so to hear her story against a backdrop of what happened in, back in the day with Africa, but bringing it current to me is really relevant. Um, I think it's called a world without war would be part of that. And, and I'm, I'm trying to think, but also with the school of math and science, when you think about the fact that you now have, literally you have classes on it, thinking about the state of North Carolina. And can I just be kind of honest for a minute? We came here as property, as slaves. <laughs> and you think about where we are now in 2021. And when she mentioned the election of, of Kamala Harris or Joseph Biden and filling out what, what had to transform in our country, which is not that old. Um, so I'm kind of like, my mind is reeling in kind of an exciting kind of way, but now what do we do with it now? We have this amazing opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing was interesting in 2005, um, there was a 1000 women for the Nobel Peace Prize. And what I liked about that, and back in the day it would always be one person and no shade, a lot of mostly men, but to have the dynamic when Fanny said, no, you have to talk about all women, and it's a book this thick, but it had country after country and after country. And I'll end with this one that was really kind of like a, an eye opener. The hundredth woman was named anonymous because these are the women, had they been known, had they been found out, they would have been murdered, they would have been jailed. And so to have that happen in 2005, we're now in 2021, and listening to what we just heard now, what do we do with that moving forward? I think that's the challenge. I think that's also the amazing opportunity, um, but I'll end there. And, and as a member of the Warrior Sisters League, I joined when I was 18 in 1967. And so I'm sitting here thinking, and why do we keep staying in this for the long haul? Because we really do believe change can happen. So I'll pass it on to Vernetta. All right, well, uh, thank you, Mandy. And uh, thank you all for, for having me uh, join the conversation. I really, really appreciated the keynote. And uh, to your question, Adam, I think there's so many, and, and to Mandy's comments, there's so many important takeaways and you know, so many things that resonate. A couple that you know, kind of come to mind is first, just kind of the theme of this and, the, and thinking about coalition building, but just thinking, you know, hearing President Sirleaf's uh, remarks about confronting you know, different types of crises and uh, the obvious parallels between um, you know, her experience and her work and, you know, where, where we find ourselves uh, in the pandemic. And now, especially, you know, having enough, um, enough a year's worth of experience in the pandemic to be a little reflective on how, what the responses look like. You know, I couldn't help but think of a couple of things practically for myself, you know, when the pandemic started, I was on the Durham City Council, as you mentioned. And so I had a a few weeks, the, kind of the first few intense weeks of, of pandemic response and shutdown of seeing kind of locally what coalition building really looked like to try to help people, at least at least an, an effort towards it amongst, you know, kind of government stakeholders and, you know, folks in the community uh, and just, you know, saw a really humbling and, and powerful effort on everyone's part to communicate uh, and to work together uh, and then I got thrust into the state legislature 
uh, where there was some of that, but you know the dynamics, um, the political dynamics that you know we found ourselves in last year and still do today, uh, are so much more complex and are less geared towards um, political compromise and and coalition work. Uh, and so to 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 kind of stack those two things up and see that you know uh, kind of an unfortunate reality of of opportunities that were missed and, and that were and were hard to cultivate because of years of, of lack of investment and lack of kind of good working relationships among different agencies and amongst you know folks in, in, in the political realm you know seeing those things really uh, have real world costs um, to you know folks in our communities um, and so when she when she was during the keynote you know I just couldn't help but think of uh, you know what valuable experience she has to offer to us and how sobering it is to think of the fact that, you know, we consider ourselves in so many ways to be so exceptional, you know, as a, mm. as a country and as a nation, and to recognize that, you know, there are folks like President Sirleaf, Sirleaf who have so much to offer by way of experience, uh, you know, who have succeeded in so many ways in thinking about how to build coalition uh, that we have not mastered, you know, and that have clearly had a real toll on uh, the lives of the people that we serve and that we care about. And so, you know, I, it was sobering to hear and so important. And I feel like I have so much more to learn. Um, so those are a few thoughts. I won't ramble any farther. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Dr. Scully, Mira, if you'd like to uh, uh, share a bit of perspective there, given I know obviously you've written a book about um, Alan Johnson's relief and this is your area of study. Sure. And, you know, one thing that obviously didn't come out of my um, bio was that uh, I, w I did a lot of work, well, quite a lot of work with the Carter Center in Liberia. And also you can hear my accent is not <laughs> American. So I grew up, you know, white privilege in South Africa, I married an American, here I am. But so, so two things I would say, I, I want to just say, what was I, you know, what stood, stayed with me from President Sirleaf's talk, and I just want to say sort of everything, <laughs> but if I have to choose, um, <laughs> I do think it's the importance of collaboration and um, dem democratic engagement in a, in, in, in a meaningful way, because uh, what I keep trying to lift up is that you know, when, when Ebola was um, happening in West Africa, um, the the media the, the the U.S. media coverage actually you know the international media coverage was so was so racist frankly it was you know people you know I mean it was just you can imagine what they were saying and so um so I got engaged in that then just of saying you don't understand people are there's a reason people aren't going to hospitals and clinics because because of the as President Sirleaf was saying. The, and this is a whole legacy of a whole bunch of history in Liberia, but the, the clinics and the hospitals were so under-resourced and understaffed, et cetera, et cetera, that you were likely to die if you went. And so people, it's not that people were quote unquote, well, you can imagine what was being said. It was that people were making a judicious um, evaluation of where they would best be. And that is why I think, if I, you know, to, to the points made just now is that I think Liberia and other places offer so much insight and experience that that the US could benefit from if only we understood that we should listen and not just wander around the world telling people what to do. And I, I have I've written about that too, in part from having been in Liberia and seeing um, some of the really egregious uh, things that were done there in terms of just um, talking about quote unquote lack of capacity all the time of Liberians. And it's really a question of what counts as capacity. But then the, the last thing I'll say, just uh, with regard to what Ms. Carter was saying, well, actually what you were saying also Representative Olson was, you know, I come from South Africa and I'm an historian of comparative women's history and um, race, I guess. And, you know, what I think Black Lives Matter and this moment we find ourselves in now in the United States is we aren't exceptional. We are a history with a, we are a, what we call in historical terms, a settler colonial society with histories of colonialism, genocide, enslavement, all the things that you see in other colonized societies. And that's what we have to grapple with. And we can't do it without the insights that President Sirleaf was saying, which is it's all about 
it's about acknowledgement, collaboration, and, and actually s telling it like it is. Um, and that is a very, very hard thing for societies to do, but you can't move, you, you really can't move. You end up in endless cycles if you don't actually acknowledge. So inspired. <laughs> so uh, uh, Barbara, La, I guess it's your turn. <laughs> Thank then, you. Um... No, it's been really interesting. It's always interesting to see what people pick up from a very, you know, various talk. The first thing I wrote down on my page, which is sort of how I remember and take notes, was a phrase, the calamitous rocks of inequality. Um, and what this brought up for me and what I think uh, President Sirleaf said so eloquently is why we need to think differently. So if the normal way to think is that that inequality is calamitous rocks, not places we wanna go, not places where our footing is solid, not places where we feel balanced, then that changes the equation, right? That changes the way we see everything else. Um, and so I really appreciated the fact that she came back to that several times is how we need to think differently. And then when the last question, which I thought was uh, really, um, fantastic, the sort of, how do I, you know, hold hope? How do I keep moving forward? This is something that resonated with me. And I think also with Polly Murray's story, this idea of be yourself, right? So if we combine those of, you know, thinking differently and being yourself, trusting your experience or the experience that you gain by listening from other people, um, it, it just potentially takes us in different directions and opens the door for what she called pushing back the frontiers of possibility. Because um, I think that, that uh, right, her description of what it was like to come into the situation that she came into in Liberia and to say, no, I really, I do want everyone at the table. I do want there to be collaboration. And sometimes that's gonna work. Sometimes that's not gonna work very well, but to hold on to that as what, that sort of new normal establishing what is the way that we want to be and continuing to try to work to, to make that more and more the reality of every day for everyone. Um, you know, I really appreciated the fact that in her talk, she talked about very specific things that she did, that people, uh, that uh, folks in, in her communities did to address particular issues. But she also saw this from the balcony. She saw this big picture of how we shift uh, and the fact that she's that she could rely on her own confidence to establish, no, that's right. Maybe you haven't seen a woman in a role like this before, but here I am and I can do this, right? I, I think that kind of message and the idea that you can in fact trust uh, your own experience or the ideas that you have that may not be what the dominant society is telling you or what, uh, you know, we're learning it all the time in our textbooks and uh, on the television and all that kind of thing. I, I felt like that was just an incredibly powerful message to that invites us to think about how we shift to what we want the new normal, or as we talk about now, what we want the, the ways that we are expected to behave in relationship to one another, the ways that we can and should work together so that there is more equality and there is more uh, engaged democracy. Um, you know, I think in, to, in today's uh, culture, this is so obvious because of what's happening in the political realm of, you know, commentators explaining, which I think is so true that had we all gotten some agreement around the story in the, in the, at the end of the civil war, we wouldn't be where we are now. People are really fighting over the story Right? The reality is the reality. It, they're fighting over the way that, that, that um, we share that. And so when we think about what's happening now, uh, trying to um, bring forth those voices of truth, uh, I think is even more important. And listening to people who, whose experience is going to help us all be more collaborative, be more participatory, believe in ourselves, and hold on to hope is, you know, was a very powerful message for me in that regard. On you, Zach. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for the thoughts you've shared already. I think 
there's a really interesting through line here for these takeaways that has to do with American exceptionalism, has to do with trying to find relatable and translatable contexts with President Johnson Sirleaf. Uh, and I think that that's, that's really powerful. You know, Ms. Carter, you said it with, we, we tend to be very US focused, this US acronym, uh, Representative, Alston, Representative Alston, you talk about, um, you know, considering ourselves to be particularly exceptional and how hollow that feels when you lay that side by side with some of the narratives coming out of Liberia and the rest of the world as well. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm here today representing really my, my colleagues in Kenya. The work that I focus on is focused on holistic health and education in Kenya. But, uh, you know, there's 45 of my team that are all Kenyan leaders, sep legally and, and, and organizationally separate from the work that I do here. My job is to redirect resources and attention to their work. And um, they, you know, have many of the contexts uh, applying to their day-to-day -day lives that President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf just articulated to us. You know, one of the things that she said was uh, talking about this tension in trying to resolve Liberia's problems between the urban elite and the rural majority and having that be in parallel with this mounting tribalism that felt like it was difficult to, to get any kind of unity or any kind of consistency throughout the nation. That's also true in Kenya, but it's also true here in the United mm -hmm. States. The contexts are different, the implications are different, and what it's derived from different. And we have to acknowledge that, but there is a, a large set of translatable lessons here to pull away. So I say that for anyone that's watching, that's kind of thinking to themselves, well, I'm really passionate about what's happening in Durham, what do I take from someone who's made such an impact in Liberia? What do I do? Uh, there is plenty of, of things you could take away from, from that kind of a lesson. Um, I think the other thing I will say, though, is that despite that through line of, of translatable context, there's a lot to be said here about localized expertise and localized mm. value. Uh, I mean, I, I was so moved by the, the quote that Dr. Scully actually had in, in the introduction to President Johnson Sirleaf's talk. The, uh, by the time supplies had really reached rural Liberia confronting the Ebola crisis, Liberians had handled Ebola themselves. Uh, that's essential. That's, that's absolutely vital to think about in terms of having local expertise responding to local problems. Because when you have local expertise addressing local problems, what you get is, is nuance and little pieces of lived experience that address localized variance in the problem as well. So Ebola doesn't look the same in one rural community in Liberia versus another rural community in Liberia, let alone Liberia versus Kenya, let alone the country, the, the whole entire continent of Africa versus another continent, whatever it may be. Um, so there's a lot to be said there for valuing that, that local expertise. And I'll tell you from my context, one quick anecdote I'll share is, you know, with, with COVID, there's been a major concern worldwide about how COVID is related to girls' education. You know, the, the Malala Fund ran a study a few months ago where they estimated that by the time COVID is resolved globally, there may be 120 million adolescent girls out of school. Because with schools shut down, with resources shut down, with jobs being scarce, there aren't people to pay scholarship fees, aren't people to buy uniforms. And so how do you keep that generation of young women in an educational setting? What do you do? And um, one of the other concerns was, was related to early pregnancy. You've got girls who are out of school for an extended period of time. If adolescent pregnancy is already a crisis in your context, uh, how do you prevent that while well, girls are away from institutions? And so uh, the principal that we work with most directly is a woman named Madam Dorcas Oyugi, who's based in Kenya. And uh, she had a solution right off the bat. The second COVID came, she brought forward a solution and she said, the best way to go about this is knocking literally door to door once a week, reminding the girls that they are not out of school, they are temporarily out of school. You are still a student. You are still pursuing your education. We have not forgotten you. You are not by the road. You have not been left behind. We're just waiting and you will come back. Just that, that kind of mantra over and over again. That's the kind of approach you're not going to see in a multilateral collaboration. It's the kind of thing you're not going to see in a policy recommendation, but by God, it works. Um, you know, we, the school that Dorcas heads with almost 250 students in it uh, had 2% of their population uh, come back pregnant after the COVID shutdowns and the surrounding schools averaged 18%, drastically different. And if you ask Dorcas, what was the difference? It was knocking doors. So I think, I think there's something really powerful there about that localized approach. And I imagine that uh, President Johnson Sirleaf is full of that kind of expertise. I appreciate her sharing that with us. 
Um, I, I think sort of on that, it makes me uh, maybe want to toss out a question here based on that too. When we think about how, to, how, how do we actually do the work of this in some way? And um, so I'm going to tie these two questions together and then just whoever wants to kind of jump in can. I, um, we hear the term sort of systemic often, right? So, so I wonder for folks at home, if you could talk a little bit about, or at least from your perspective, you know, what does it mean for a problem to be systemic and how do we go about sort of creating more just systems or maybe what experience have you had in working at Zach, you're talking about some things there, but I wonder um, if folks could talk a little bit about that or maybe even just what's a day uh, in the life like when we're trying to do those things. Well, I had a question to follow up on Zach. Um, and this is a question I think for anyone on here. I had the opportunity to go to Zimbabwe with the Rural Council of Churches. They have these seven, what are these every seven year um, things? It was in the time of Mugabe. Mm. That was the AIDS crisis. And I'm sitting here thinking about if you had to look back and that regimen, it's like it didn't exist. It's very anti. Um, and we're at the University of Zimbabwe for like a week or so. And I was so struck by this denial, the Bible and so on and so forth. But but I'm also then also thinking now when you think about COVID. So Zach, I just appreciate what you just shared. So I have two practical questions and I'll open it up. One is how many people actually migrate and get to the United States and where, where are the majority of the librarians living? As she, I think she mentioned that there are communities in large places, like where would they be coming and, and where they are and how do they keep that connect? But the thing that I was most struck about is as a black lesbian, for me to go down to Zimbabwe, I was like, that's the motherland. And I was stunned at the poverty. I was stunned at the inequity. I was stunned at the kind of major backlash. Now within the, within the World Council of Churches where we were at the University of Zimbabwe, we could have these really, there must've been several thousand, I think maybe a couple of thousand, but we could have within that confine, we could have very open conversations. And one of the ones that came up being, being black and a lesbian there where they could actually talk about it, there's, a, there's an, organ, an international organization for LGBTQ. And I, maybe, I, maybe I just had this, this is weird to say, maybe I had this romantic vision of going back to the motherland, right? And I understand that. And where does that come from? So that gets a little bit about what do we talk in school, what we don't know, why do we romanticize it? But I was really struck about how these big boulevards were there and all the money coming out of the, of the natural resources, you know, so you got a real grounding. And I must tell you, I was really perplexed about what could I do as an American spending time in Zimbabwe. Mab Sugris was down there. She, I think she went on to another country, but coming back home and actually feeling absolutely, can I use the term, not powerlessness, but how does this keep on happening? And where are we now? And what, what would have to happen so dramatically to change that um, in the year 2021? But, but, the, but the parallels of that AIDS crisis and how they dealt with it then and where we are with COVID, I'm just gonna open it up. But I must tell you, um, I came back, I, I, and has anyone else ever been to any other parts of Africa? I'm just wondering, literally, literally there, or you can do virtually, I'll just stop there, I'm rambling, but I have, it was one of the most powerful moments of my life to this day. And now what do we do with it now? So I'll stop and pass it on to whoever would like to pick that up. <laughs> I'll, I'll pick up in the uh, um, sort of homophobic, I guess, um, uh, trends in Africa. And one thing we do, um, one thing I think is historically accurate is, and there's the, a few historians working on this, is that and it's not to say once upon a time everything was perfect in Africa because that has its own challenges, but certainly um, historians, um, I think, quite strongly argue that the kind of particular sort of anti-gay homophobia um, that we see currently in, in places like Uganda and, you know, maybe Zimbabwe and parts of South Africa, um, you can't separate from colonialism. Mm -hmm. that, that they that they are they are also a colonial story and in Uganda in particular which is in Central Africa uh, borders on Kenya um, there's actually um, quite a lot of evidence that it's also tied to particular kind of evangelical proselytizing much more recently mm -hmm. out of Texas and places that that have really been whipping up really are like promoting homophobia and it's quite interesting so I'm, I'm literally uh, 
when I'm not doing this uh, over the weekend, um, preparing for this event, I was reading a manuscript of a, of a South African woman, African woman who lived, um, I think she was born in 1904 and died, I haven't got to the end of the manuscript, so <laughs> died sometime, you know, let's say the 1970s. And she was a, a she came from a rural area, Zulu, uh, Zulu rural area in KwaZulu Natal, and um, was a journalist and wrote books under the radar because she wasn't allowed to, etc., etc., etc. But she was, she ended up marrying a man, uh, also uh, from Zululand, who was, um, it turned out, was having a sexual relationship with another man at the same time as he was going out with her, and it's complicated because the other man was white and seemed to have some power over this man. But the, what was really interesting in the manuscript was the degree to which that wasn't an issue. It, it didn't surface as at least an issue around sexuality. It's like that there even needed to be a debate about, well, you know, is he bisexual? What's going on here? It just, it just was sort of noticed. And the, the, her fiance said, yes, when we get married, I'm gonna have to, you know, stop see. But there was, it wasn't given the freighting weight of, of you know how we talk about sexuality so all just to say is is these things are so complicated and um, some of them are very recent history uh, as in Uganda I think uh, some of them are a longer colonial story and um, anyway I'll just stop there for now thank you so you know, just coming back to something that uh, Dr. Scully, you talked about uh, is about the story when we think about these systems. So I wanna give a shout out to the folks that are fighting the battle over the new North Carolina state humanities um, and history uh, standards. Um, and how until we have textbooks in every state, in every high school in this country that include people like Pauli Murray and Bayard Rustin uh, that really begin to shift the way that we teach about who we are, the way we tell our mm -hmm. own story. I, I think that's one of the big systemic changes that I'm seeing because that system of indoctrination into our exceptionalism and that system of white supremacy and patriarchy that is so prevalent in how we teach our story uh, that it becomes almost invisible. I, I think problematizing that and troubling that way before we get to college, because of course, college professors, that's a lot of, you know, they have to help students unlearn what they thought they knew, but not everybody goes to college and not everybody uh, reads history. And so I think that those, the strategies that begin to really create the, the, a more accurate story and a more accurate reckoning with our settler colonial past and that just the recognition that that's who we are, uh, or that's who we are as a country. You know, obviously, all of us have have different um, uh, genealogies in that in that story. I think that's really, you know, that's one of the areas. I have to say, though, I'm not usually hu a huge sort of policy person. Um, I, I I believe in policy, but I but policy is uh, only as good as the people who put it in place. And as a folklorist. One of the things we also think about is how traditions, you know, cultural traditions, whether those be food or ceremony, ritual, you know, how do those also reinforce the ways that we think about ourselves and how do those change over time and adapt and become, uh, you know, so for example, just uh, we were just talking about the LGBTQ world, uh, the notion of wedding has changed as a tradition in this country relatively quickly. And so even people who might look like traditional uh, uh, participants in that, brides and grooms, as it were, completely think about that ritual in a different way. Um, and so I think that that's also an important thing for us to be paying attention to. And again, be thinking differently uh, and thinking about other ways that we might uh, model for mm. the people around us. I thought that was another really powerful mm. piece of her talk model that courage that she's talking about for the people around us um, and how much we uh, speak openly about those kinds of things that we're doing that are different um, so that other folks can feel more comfortable in that as I always talk about it expanding the rubber band right so there's more room in the middle for more mm -hmm. people to fit so some of us play the role of 
pushing at the edges. Some of us are wholly in the middle. You know, we, we operate differently in those systems, but um, beginning to, to really think about that as a systemic change to how we think about ourselves so that we can confront some of these systems of oppression. Yeah, I, I want to go off of what Dr. Lau was just saying about uh, th that allusion to the ongoing conversation about the North Carolina curriculum. And for, for those of you who are watching at home, a little background on that. There's a debate currently about whether or not North Carolina can formally in its humanities and history curriculum uh, teach the phrase systemic racism, whether or not systemic can be named out loud in the textbooks. Um, and the thing that has always, since we're talking about, you know, how, how do you understand the word systemic in this context. Um, I, I, when I found this debate the first time, I thought it was hysterical to me because I remember being in middle school and high school in this state, in public school in North Carolina, mm -hmm. uh, learning about de jure and de facto discrimination, which if you can understand the difference between de jure and de facto discrimination, you're very close to talking about systemic violence anyway. <laughs> um, so this is, I think, largely a debate over terminology, but uh, you know, de jure discrimination being that it's been codified, de facto being it exists, but it's not formally codified or in law. Uh, both of those things exist. And I think that's the crux of what systemic issues are. Uh, it's that you could spend your entire lifetime advocating for, pushing for the removal of de facto discrimination in all of its forms. Uh, and at the end of the day, at the end of your lifetime, if you had eradicated de facto issues from the world, you would not be done. There would still be so much left to do. Um, and the same thing, vice versa. If you could get rid of every horrible policy, every violating law, and you still wouldn't be done. And that's, that's the piece of this that I think is important to understand. It's, um, you know, maybe a, a metaphor that I like to use sometimes is it's, it's as if you have a, a table, think of kind of a, a mosaic tile laden table and you've, you've spilled some kind of a, a fruit juice on it, something that's dark and red and difficult to get out, uh, you can scrub that table to death. And at the end of the day, you're gonna have some kind of stickiness between the tiles you just didn't get to and it's not going anywhere. Um, and that's, that's part of that systemic construct mm. that we have to understand. And, and I think the best way you can tackle it, frankly, is to look for opportunities to subvert. Um, anytime someone is trying to subvert either through a new form of innovation, a new form of radical gathering. I mean, I think President Johnson Sirleaf out, um, alluded to this a little bit when she was talking about rather than trying to meet existing standards, I think was the way she phrased it, uh, decide what those standards should be on your own and hit those targets instead. That's That kind of fresh perspective is going to help tremendously if you're going to address something that is systemic. I'll say Zach is uh, making uh, my job seem bleaker and bleaker <laughs> to try to do <laughs> policy, but you know I don't know that I can disagree with his assessment uh, and definition. So uh, you know I just yeah, to piggyback off that a little bit from you know someone who does work in policy and or in you know state uh, legislative policy um, and, and to your question, Adam, about kind of what's our what's this work look like and from my perspective and and, and my context um you know I, especially coming from durham you know I, this is a constituency and a place that you know cares deeply about you know tackling things like systemic racism and i'm really proud to, to represent folks uh, in district 29 and in this county and so for me you know big picture I think every single day, especially during this session where we're going to be filing a, a lot of bills and thinking very seriously about how we can re reform um, our institutions, think very seriously about, you know, what, what are the assumptions, you know, kind of embedded in our, uh, in our policy decisions and the practices of our agency, where are there places where, you know, uh, uh, where are their decision-making points that have historically and are currently being infected uh, by racism, by gender bias, by uh, 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 classism and, and lack of consideration of uh, um, wealth disparities and, and the, the, the fact and, and a lack of compassion around just what feels like a basic responsibility about providing people's basic needs. Uh, so I think about that every single day. Um, and 
uh, I think maybe in part to Zach's point, we're, so we're, we're working in an environment that from my perspective is very challenging. And so, you know, I think we think about how can we be creative? How can we be subversive in a way that will actually work? Um, because, you know, coming through the front door, again, for the policy positions that I support and the dynamics of the General Assembly, going through the front door and, and kind of creating change feels very difficult right now. So, uh, you know, I think we think about how to, how to, how to <clears throat> come at things in, in different and innovative and perhaps sometimes subversive ways. And uh, we think about these, these big picture, picture questions uh, and it, it, it comes down to things like coalition building, quite frankly, and the work every single day to engage with stakeholders, to engage, to listen to folks who are being impacted by the crises that we find ourselves in, build relationships with people across the aisle uh, to try to find some common ground and, and make progress, even if it's subtle at times, that can hopefully in the long run have a big impact on our institutions. Um, so I'll just wanted to add that. Can I just follow up real quick? Um, with Representative Renetta Alston, we're sitting in the state of North Carolina. <clears throat> when those glaciers were coming up or along the Atlantic coast, there's a place called Somerset Plantation, the second largest slave plantation in the state of North Carolina. So when you think about what that was and all that, and you know, we have the old background of slavery and where they were, Virginia, North Carolina, going up into before us, tobacco going up into, up into Boston. And again, I'd like to ask that question. Um, when people are moving here, however they get here, or what you just said, Zach, as well, this gets to what you're doing, Vernetta. What happens at the General Assembly? Is this something that the entire General Assembly gets to decide? Is this something that some individuals, depending on what county and who they represent, gets to decide? And I think the bigger question is, we're, we're about ready to get a 14th congressional district here. People mm. are moving in droves to the state of North Carolina. What would they need to know and how would this be some information, especially when going into elementary school, going into high school, so on and so forth. So there's a bigger picture of why this, this conversation today is so timely and to hear what she had to share about what happened in Liberia. But then you think now, what do we do with going forward? So Vernetta, when you're over there, you know, does, does stuff come, around, come up around the school or who has control of the school board, who doesn't, and why it matters if you might want to go to your individual school board meeting to figure out what they're teaching in those high schools and elementary schools. I'll just leave it there, but I just think it's a grateful thank you to you and other people who run for public office, because I think there's a wonderful connection for those of us who do a lot of grassroots on the ground organizing, so it's kind of a changing hearts and minds, changing a public policy, and where do the twain come together? Or how do you make sure that you keep on doing this? And not only in English, by the way, you know, thinking about all the other kind of um, cultural parts of that. But, but, but what I'm inspired about today is just saying, these are opportunities, these are the questions, these are the wonderful challenges that we all have. And now what do we wanna do with it? So Vernetta, I'm just, can I just throw it back to you? The question about what gets teaching in these schools, is that coming up with y'all or is that something independently by county or city? Uh, it comes up with a lot of people, I think. Uh, <laughs> it definitely comes up in Raleigh. Uh, you know, I think all things education, including curriculum, you know, are huge, well, are hot button issues, you know, for better and, and, and worse. You know, the, the, fact, the fact that, for, the fact that it, there's so much politically charged debate around uh, our children and education, mm -hmm. you know, is can it has so often been in the has made it has also often just been de depressing um uh because we aren't I, I, in my mind there's still so much work to be done to serve our children adequately uh, and fairly and equitably um so it comes up obviously in raleigh um and but to something that you said you know i think in terms of engagement uh it's just as important uh for folks who care about these issues for folks who have uh, perspectives around curriculum that they want to share to absolutely engage with their county officials, with their local school boards, with their parents groups in their schools, uh, and certainly with folks uh, in Department of Public in Instruction or the folks in the General Assembly. I, I think it has to be a full court press kind of always because um, these issues are fraught. They are very politically charged. They are very powerful stakeholders on all sides. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it requires, you know, I, I think uh, advocates with a lot of agency and a lot of capacity and a lot of kind of persistence um, uh, around these issues. So I hope, hope that answers some of your question, Mandy. 
I, I also want to put a word in for historic sites and other ways that people learn about the history, right? So I know there's been a lot of changes. My colleague, Michelle Lanier, a fellow folklorist, is very influential now in the Department of Cultural Resources and really pushing all the state historic sites to tell a bigger story uh, and to really look, go back and think about like what is the impact of what they're telling. Our site, the Pauli Murray Center, is a National Historic Landmark. There are only 39 of them in the state of North Carolina. And we're the first one focused on primarily on a, the story of a woman. And the first one in the country focused on a, an African-American woman who was LGBTQ. So I only say that to say that as we shift the landscape, what do people come across? How do people engage with all the ways folks learn about a place or the past? Places like historic sites, places um, you know that are outside the K-12 um, schools, and, and then are also resources for K-12 schools, also become this important way for people who are moving to North Carolina to learn more about the places that they're living. So if you move to Wilmington, you're not, you know, you're learning about the, the race massacre in 1898. If you're moving to Asheville, you're learning about the vibrant African-American community that was part of downtown. You know, the, these are highly under-resourced efforts, um, mostly done by people who see it as a vocation for, or an avocation versus a, a vocation. And I think that those are all, all those ways are ways that we shift that narrative. We shift that way that we think about who we are and hopefully our responsibility to one another because acknowledging what's happened is only the first step in, in the, the, that longer process of repair and reckoning and hopefully at some point healing. But, you know, I think there's a lot of arenas. Um, I know you even do this in your own work, Mandy, because you remind us through your work about how Durham was the, the home of song, how Durham was, you know, that, that there's a lot of things that don't, haven't made it into quote unquote, the textbooks. And I just have to say, I hope that one of the things that we've learned through COVID is all resources are not books that are mm -hmm. actual paper books. Mm -hmm. That as we try to build online resources that are accessible to families and young people and, and teachers, that it can open up and make that transition more quickly. I have a friend who wrote a North Carolina history book and it's a great book, but it doesn't mean it's been adopted by local school boards and is being taught. And I think this is where Zach, you know, I have a little, it's like a kind of a pushback in the sense that sometimes local decision-making is decision-making that maintains the status quo mm -hmm. and that, that trying to disrupt that, you know, sometimes it takes outside intervention to disrupt uh, some of the, the, the ways that local school boards, I think this is a tension in our country for a long time, the sort of local versus state versus national, but uh, school boards in particular have a tremendous amount of power mm -hmm. on the local level, and they're the ones in the past who have adopted what book, you know. Um, and so it, it is, you know, it happens on all levels, and I think we all have a role to play in uh, pushing, um, in pushing new stories. And someone in the, yes, there's, we have champions in, in our schools, in Durham Public Schools, who do an excellent mm -hmm. job of teaching Durham history, mm -hmm. uh, engaging students in that, you know, I think that the more resources and the more latitude we can give them, the better job that they'll do. And maybe Durham can be a model for other places in the state and the country. Can I, I, I just put it in the chat, but just to give a, a shout out to Brian Stevenson, mm. you know, who's known for his work and the, and the book and the film Just Mercy, but he has done so much to put lynching on the national yes. agenda with his, you know, with the um, the museum in Montgomery, and then he's mm. he's launched this lynching in America site. As to your point about this, it's not just books, and mm -hmm. but I think the more we can do that, but the issue of power is so mm. is so significant because you know um, a, a feminist theorist, Yatri Spivak, wrote this very sort of landmark uh, piece many years ago called you know can the subaltern speak and increasingly i just and it's excellent work uh, it's really can people listen <laughs> to the working class and to the poor it's not that they're not speaking always but that um yeah do people in power listen and what are the ways that get to 
how do you get to have authority in the world? Um, and one thing, I'll just end here, but I, I, I'm really interested increasingly um, from my purview as Vice Provost for Undergraduate Affairs, I'm thinking about student success and equity in, mm. in um, the college experience. You know, Dr. Anthony Jack, who's written this really excellent book called The Privileged Poor, which is about the experience of um, basically working class poor uh, students from lower income backgrounds who go to private high schools, go to private colleges, go to private universities, you know, elite private universities like Emory and the experience they have through that. And we had him last week, I think it was uh, at Emory giving a virtual uh, talk and we were in conversation with him and he was so excellent and in, in I, Without using the word class, he, he did. He, he pointed to the significance of uh, incredible inequality back to systemic around class. And of course, it, you know, it, it, it so aligns with race because it's also, you know, it's a racist country. But um, sometimes I think we really also need to lift up the issue of, of poverty and class and people's and how that determines what school you go to and our tax laws and mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah there's a there's a very interesting interaction there between sort of um because uh, i'm so glad you all brought this up because i had a question about education in this sense of sort of there's the, the formal and the informal as well and we see this interaction between those things or policy versus grassroots mm -hmm. right and the interaction between those two that is probably uh in, in many ways sort of essential to it i want to go back to something that um that barbara said a minute ago too about um, the historic site um, and that Pauline Murray being the only one in North Carolina focused on, on a woman. And, and I, I wanted to sort of talk a little bit about, and maybe in that sort of informal way too, you know, the, the Women of Liberia Mass Action mm -hmm. uh, for Peace Movement was a movement of mothers, right? Mm -hmm. um, who, who, who drew the line essentially. Um, and of course, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was the uh, first democratically elected uh, when president uh, in Africa, and she also appointed you know women to positions of of uh, important power in her cabinet. Um, could could folks talk a little bit about the unique role I think that we see emerging here that that women can play in this that and must play in this kind of work, um, and and maybe what we can draw from that. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking as a woman, and I'll own it. Um, we find ourselves in an interesting, also an interesting conversation because we're now looking at last year was the, uh, the hundredth anniversary of when women had the right to vote and getting the right, the issue. What was it, uh, Barb, you were part of that and others on this call. And I find it interesting and I'm not gonna be um, shy about this. When these lands were first settled and you think about who was already here indigenous to these lands, it was white men called the founding fathers, really? <laughs> And they decided that the first set of people told, but not you were women, half the population. And then after that got done with that little list, they also decided that, like I said, I'll repeat what I said, we came here literally as property, but yet we saw the pushback and we also saw the, saw the mobilization and the organizing that had to have happened when we were so disempowered. And I have to ask the question and I, I'll, I'll, it's a rhetorical one, but how did that happen? And I'm sitting here thinking in two years from now, no, wait, is this is 20, in three years from now, we're gonna be celebrating and or acknowledging, I don't wanna use the word celebrating, commemorating Freedom Summer. When you had a thousand white students come from across this country to go down to a real rural Mississippi and get them to write the vote and understanding that what had to have happened, you had people like Bayard Rustin and the Lawsons, you know, black folk um, teaching and they all came into a school where Coretta Scott King went and did a training around nonviolence and the history and the history of, this, of, of the state of Mississippi. And then looking at the horror, and this is on the back of what happened in 60, uh, I'm sorry, right after the March on Washington in 63, when you had the brutal murders of those four young girls in Birmingham, Alabama. What is it about a society that is so, and when I say the society at the time, that you can't have it, you'll never get it. The Klan would just wear white robes, they come and kill you. Then all of a sudden it not became white rose, it became the uh, uniform of blue with the but a police and green with the military. And look what just happened on January 6th. So what is it about when you understand that you have to have full equality and justice for all, but some people are saying, but not you, and what we have to do to try to stop you. So I'm gonna give a little shout out for a, a wonderful program um, that is called Social Justice Storytime. Social Justice Storytime, pre-COVID, you might've heard about this, Renetta. 
it was like taking kids to the Durham County Library from the age of zero to like eight years old. And they would have these little things with the children saying, how do you tell a three-year-old or a four-year-old about language justice? How do you tell a three-year-old or a four-year-old about food justice? In an interesting kind of way, I don't, unless you think we're born racist or homophobic, I don't think any of us, we are, we're born this wonderful bundle of joy. But what in this society just kind of kind of gets us on this track about us and them and you and me and whatever, but then how do we collectively, once again, with the public policy and grassroots organizing, change this. But if people want to hold on to power so much that they'll kill you and or figure out how they can do it um, through the legislature or through like, you know, I'm looking at you, Zach, just common everyday practice. What do you hear around you? So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic, but I'm also thinking what has to happen and generationally, generationally. I'm now 72, but I remember when I was, you know, born in 1948, there's a whole bunch of us baby boomers that are probably on this call, but there's a lot of 16 to 35 year olds also maybe on the Zoom and think about those before us and those coming into it. So moving forward, what is what are some of the wonderful, amazing ways that we get to do that, whether it's in public institution or not in grassroots? But so I'm optimistic, but I'm also furious about why this continues to be the pattern. And we have it, we don't want to have you get it. And it's just a question of, of, of time and when it will happen. So I'll stop there. I'm, that's my rant, but that's my optimism as well. <laughs> Pass it to you, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I I should say, so my work with Wiser is fundamentally on every level about the empowerment of women and girls. Mm -hmm. um, literally, the, the acronym for Wiser originally was Women's Institute for Secondary Education and Research. And when it comes to putting women in charge of movements and investing in women as the future of politics and society, there are there's, there's an efficiency argument that's usually made or an effectiveness argument that's usually made, um, a very utilitarian argument, uh, especially in the development space, because we, we know things that, for instance, um, countries where women receive higher education on average have a higher GDP over the span of 10 years. We know that when uh, women finish high school in sub-Saharan Africa, their daughters have a 50% reduced mm. chance of HIV. We know that uh, for every dollar that a woman in sub-Saharan Africa reinvests back into her communities, her male counterparts reinvest between a third and a half of that, somewhere, somewhere in that realm. So there's, there's a lot of reasons from a utilitarian aspect that it is wise and prudent to invest in women worldwide, period. Mm -hmm. However, that, I think, is a tendency for people in the very data-driven, development-driven space um, and I think we're letting a little bit of our American capitalism show when we lean on that utilitarian argument, because there's also the uh, human rights argument, which is you should put women in charge because why not? Like, I mean, really, why not? <laughs> there's mm -hmm. that, that the fundamental argument that uh, people deserve opportunities to lead movements and lead opportunities that they are familiar with, that they would perform well in. Um, I think there's a ton to be said also about lived experience. Um, and if, for example, you know, Wiser's work in Kenya, all of our decision makers in Kenya are women. They're all Kenyan mm -hmm. women. There's a lot of value in that, in that lived experience that's translatable to action. Um, you want experts, right, to, to be a part of these movements and who better to act as an expert than the people that know it best. As we're, um, I'm happy to hear more uh, on that as well, if folks wish to, but we are drawing near the end of our time uh, together, at least for all of us here. So we have about five more minutes or so. Mm -hmm. And I just also want to open the floor in these last five minutes for folks. Um, we have uh, a, a lot of people on this call, um, but specifically we have uh, a lot of students and young people. Mm -hmm. um, we heard uh, Madam Johnson Sirleaf talk about, um, you know, the need to do something, say something, be something. Um, and so the two questions I have that I would love to hear any quick response to that you have is essentially how, how does someone, we all want to, to be able to do something, uh, what can a young person right now in North Carolina do? What should they be thinking about ways that they can impact the world around them? How can they help? And the other thing I'd ask, also ask is um, how does, what does wellness play in that? This is hard work. You all do very difficult, challenging work, and we all know it is challenging. How, how do we take care of ourselves as, as well while taking care of uh, others and being in service of others? Thanks. 
Gee, Adam, really small questions here for us in five minutes. Um, Sorry. Just, it's okay. <laughs> I'm just going to say really quickly, um, one of the things that I also appreciated about the question to President um, Johnson Sirleaf was about how you hold on to hope. Mm -hmm. And I think that as, as a student of, of the past, one of the things that, of course, we see is that so many people who fought so hard for justice didn't see the justice in their lifetime that they were fighting for. Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, I think that I've always believed that learning from people, from their strategies, from their stories, from their inspiration helps us hold on to that, knowing that we're just the, the next person in the relay race, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Pauline Marie talked about that. Mm -hmm. Who's handing the baton to you? how much you have to be connected to them to actually get a firm hold of that. And who are you handing it off to um, while also holding on to the potential and in, in Polly's case, the potential of democracy, uh, the potential, the potential for uh, justice for everyone. So I think I would think about ways I can invest in, in myself so that I can hold on to the hope. And I think that's what I hope that young people who come to our site, but who also come into my uh, milieu, you know, my arena, that's, that's something that I can also pass on to them uh, as, as people have passed it on to me. Uh, I'll say, uh, hopefully just a, a couple things quickly. Um, I think uh, a few things. I think young people should, uh, you know, the kind of things that we're talking about and the issues that the, this conversation is sitting around are, are big, you know, kind of to Barbara's point, uh, you mm -hmm. know, about the pace of change. Um, and just recognize that, you know, you can do something, you know, as President Johnson Sirleaf said, every single day by supporting the people you care about, just standing up for people that you care about and around issues that matter to you in the little ways, in your own household, every single day, at, at school, uh, whatever the case may be, those things matter um, because you know you empower you know, individuals and that has a ripple effect that can be really, really important in your own communities. Um, and I had another thought that just left me, but, uh, but also just, just, you know, I'm a big believer in, you know, giving young people, you know, uh, an equal amount of agency in the, in the work that we do. You know, if a young person calls me, you know, I care as much about their, as much about, much about what matters to them as a constituent mm -hmm. as if, you know, one of the folks on this panel calls. So just recognize that the power you have in your voice. And if there's something that you're concerned about, a question that you have, you know, for someone like me, for instance, mm -hmm. You don't have to ask, you know, someone who's over 18 to, to call or, or go through some organization. You have that power yourself. Um, so hold your leaders accountable with a phone call. You know, I tell people you can text me. I'd rather you didn't, but you can text me if you need to. <laughs> Send me an email. Uh, attend, you know, uh, uh, local board meetings. Join a board. You know, there are so many wonderful places that are now, you know, again, kind of recognize the, the capacity and the, the, the need for youth voices. So uh, join a board, you know, just take up space, like take, grab power and, 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 and hold it um, because your voices matter. Um, so those are a few things that come to mind. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I'm so glad there are a lot of students on this call. I love mm -hmm. talking to students, working with students. Um, I was one not long ago. <laughs> um, so this is a young, young, young person giving advice to young people, but, um, I want you all to know that I, I joke often with my friends and my fiance that Gen Z is going to save us all. Um, I, I love their, their chaotic and persistent energy, and I'm a huge fan of it. Um, I think there is something to look at in the questions we got today, though. There's something important there about that wellness question, right? Because two of the questions we heard from students were, how do you maintain hope? And I see a lot of people give up when they make a little bit of progress. There's this exhaustion in those questions and to be burnt out at 16 is rough um, but I understand why you would feel that there's a lot going on and you've you've kind of entered this space where you're being challenged to learn new things and grow in a particularly tumultuous time um, but that being said um, I think that one of the best things you can do is give yourself a ton of grace a ton of grace give yourself time give yourself space um, be fiercely kind um, being fiercely kind means 
sometimes doing things that aren't nice, but uh, are, are fiercely kind and defensive of not just people that deserve to be defended, but of yourself as well. Defend your time, defend your stance, protect yourself. Um, and then also on top of that, uh, get exposure. Just go, exactly like Representative Alston was talking about. Go to meetings, uh, go to talks, come to things like this. Um, but also diversify your media streams. Please, 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 please. What are the best things you can possibly do? If you're on on TikTok, if you're on Instagram, if you follow uh, influencers, if you follow people who are starting their own small businesses, if you follow uh, storytellers, go home today, look at, or you're probably home already, um, go, <laughs> go home, look at your, your following list and ask yourself about who's represented in your media. You know, how, of all the people that you follow, how many of them are people of color? How many of them are refugees? How many of them are non-native English speakers? How many of them are from outside the US? How many of them are trans people? How many, just go through and see if you can find influencers, artists, activists, politicians, students, anyone that gives you a better picture of what the world is, is like. Um, it will do nothing but benefit and challenge you, I promise. Can I just say something quickly? I, I can't, uh, that one's accent is, was flawless, uh, but it just, it just reminded me that, you know, I'm just old enough to say this. <laughs> for young people, the, for all of us, but the pace of information that you all uh, are accustomed to is just it's it's out it's 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 outrageous <laughs> um and you know the pace that i know i i feel and i'm sure other folks do as well the pace at which you feel like you need to respond to things and and to be present on social media is it's just it's back breaking and uh and stressful so you know i won't try to repeat what Zach said, it was flawless, but just want to emphasize and underline his comments because um, it's really, really important, particularly in this day and age. Thank you so much. Um, we'll, we'll have to end our, our discussion there, unfortunately, but um, uh, I do want to take the time to make sure I have time to be able to thank all of you so much uh, for joining us, you know, for your, your time your grace and your, your tireless work that you're, um, you're all doing. So um, <clears throat> Ellen Johnson certainly uh, said in her, uh, in her speech there in the question and answer that we should listen to those who have courage to stand up for principles they believe in. I couldn't think of a better example um, than the folks we've had with us here today. So thank you very much. Um, I also wanna make sure I take a moment to uh, thank the Broyhill Family Foundation uh, whose support uh, without, uh, whose support this event would not have been possible. Uh, I want to take a moment to thank Donald McIntyre and Lee Welper for their technical support and their leadership in broadcasting this event to all of you today. And finally, of course, I want to thank all of you on the call for joining us uh, in these important discussions. In her Nobel Prize speech, Madam President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf invited girls and women everywhere to find their voices, right, saying, quote, each of us has our own voice and the differences among us are to be celebrated, but our goals are in harmony. They are the pursuit of peace, the pursuit of justice. They are the defense of rights to which all people are entitled. May all of your voices continue these dialogues going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.